Hi, thank you all very much for coming. Uh, I know it's a really miserable day to be standing outside in line, so I, I really appreciate everyone that uh, took the energy and effort to do that, and I hope that my talk will be worth it. Um, so I have a really long talk and not so much time, so I'm going to get right into it. Uh, these are the things that I'm going to be going over, uh, kind of an intro of who I am and what I'm talking about. I'll be talking about a couple different codes, uh, especially the CIA's Cryptos code. I'll have some pictures of that and some other sculptures that were done by Jim Sanborn, who's the artist who made the crypto sculpture. And I'll be talking a little bit about cryptography, uh, particularly visionary tables, and some of the stuff I'm going to be going over very, very quickly, and some speculations about the crypto cipher, and then I'll tie it all together. So who am I? Um, my name's Ilanka. I am the general manager of online community at Simutronics Corporation. I'm a game developer. We make massively multiplayer online games. And I got involved with cryptography. Well, I've been in, into puzzles forever, but I got into cryptography because I was speaking on games at a convention called DragonCon in Atlanta. Has anyone here been to DragonCon? Okay. And I would be speaking in the Electronic Frontiers track, so I'd be there speaking on games, and then the panel like right after me would be the SE2600 group that would be coming in and talking about computer security. So I'd kind of meet them that way, and we'd kind of wave in the halls and have a beer at the end of the day. And through them, I heard about this code that had been uncracked for a year called the Freaknik 3 code. And they said there was a prize, and no one had cracked the code yet. And I said, that's nice, and went on and did my thing. And then, it, like about a month later, I was homesick with the flu one weekend, and I decided to take a look at this Freaknik code. And I got really into it and did practically nothing for about a week and a half except work on this code, and I cracked the code. And I won a free trip to a hacker convention and free drinks, free hotel, all the free t-shirts, all that good stuff. And then I started cracking other codes and other codes. And in fact, I cracked so many codes that this is the flyer that came out for the Atlanticon code uh, down in uh, Atlanta a couple years ago. And at the bottom of the flyer, it said, note, past puzzle crackers are ineligible for prizes <laughs> associated with solving the Atlanticon puzzle. Give someone else a chance, Ilanka. <laughs> so, so I've been I've been coming here to DEF CON for a few years. This is my first year as an official speaker. Uh, I was an alternate speaker two years ago. I was here speaking on steganography. How many people came to my steganography talk a couple years ago? Okay, and have, I've also been giving kind of informal talks on cryptography out of my room. I'd like put up a flyer and say, "Come to this hotel room." How many people have come to my hotel room talks? Okay, and okay, so total, how many people have come to a previous talk of mine, whether it's steganography, hotel, just any Alonka talk? Okay, now you guys know that sometimes I will be putting little puzzles into my talks, and I'll have like a, a secret message that's spelled out on some of the slides. I'm telling you in advance now, I did not do that this year because I'm talking about one of the most famous unsolved codes in the world, so I want all your attention on solving this code. So I didn't put in any other puzzles. So you can, don't worry about scribbling or seeing anything weird in fonts. Next year, I may put a, a puzzle into the presentation. Um, a little more background on me. Both my parents were professors at UCLA. My mother taught dance. My father taught mathematics. Uh, my father was also on the, in the early space program. He worked for Hughes Aircraft. My father was on the team that launched the very first geosynchronous communication satellite. And um, so I've got a really wide, varied background of things from, from the, the social uh, side of the campus, what we call the North Campus and South Campus, the, the hard sciences and the not so hard scientists, sciences. Um, cracked a bunch of codes. Um, after September 11th, one of the other things I did was I organized a crisis center at my company. We do internet games. And many of my customers were, of course, in New York. And so I put together a database where everyone could write in on the status of the people that were in New York. Who was OK? Who hadn't we heard from? Who was, who was an EMT that was working on the, on the rescue efforts? And one of my less scrupulous customers um, pulled a really nasty hoax, which is he decided to use September 11th as an opportunity to declare himself dead, and then was going around online pretending to be his own widow, and was really traumatizing a lot of people. And I was the person that figured that out and tracked him down and got him to post a public confession and a public apology. And there's articles about all this that are on the web if you want to go see those. Some of you may have also seen something that I got some press for recently, which is a, a website called The World's Most Famous Unsolved Codes. And that was on Slashdot recently. And I'm the one that put that together. 
That's the Freaknik 3 code. I won't go into it in detail. Um, then after I cracked the Freaknik 3 code, I wrote this tutorial about how it was done. And it's written in kind of a very tongue-in-cheek cyberpunk fashion. And through the Freaknik 3 code, which had a few dead ends in it and red herrings, one of those dead ends was, OK, go solve this now. And so there was a picture, there was a link to the CIA's crypto sculpture. And this was really the first place that I'd ever heard of the CIA's crypto sculpture. And I thought, OK, that's, that's interesting. And, and I looked at it a little bit and didn't really mess with it in, in any detail. And then after September 11th, I thought I was, I was visiting my cousin in Washington, DC. And my cousin had a close call on September 11th. He was uh, uh, on his way to give a briefing at the Pentagon. And he was having printer problems and was running late. And so he got the printer problems figured out, and then he was on his way, and he, he called his cell phone. He, he checked his cell phone messages, and his cell phone actually crashed because there were so many messages from people saying, a plane just hit the Pentagon, don't go. The plane hit right where he was going to be, so some of the people that he was supposed to brief were killed. So I went out after September 11th to D.C. to visit with my cousin, celebrate that, that he was okay. And while I was out there, we also did some sightseeing. And he said, what else do you want to see in the DC area? And I said, oh, well, as long as I'm here, I'd like to see the CIA's crypto sculpture. And he said, OK, where's CIA? And I'm like, I don't know where CIA is. And so <laughs> then we started looking for it. And uh, it, it became, I, I knew about it. I, I knew that it was, it was commissioned in 88. It was dedicated in 1990. I knew that the systems, the sculptor was a man named James Sanborn. And um, he was taught about codes by a man named Ed Scheidt. But I, I didn't know exactly where the thing was. So I wasn't going to let that stop me. I, I went on to Google and I, I looked around and there's no street address for CIA. You, you can't just go into MapQuest and, and type it in and, and get directions to it. I, okay, a challenge. And I sort of knew what the building looked like because I'd seen like overhead views and Tom Clancy movies and I knew it was in Langley, Virginia and Langley wasn't that big. So what I did is I got a bunch of satellite recon pictures of the entire Langley, Virginia area and then... <laughs> And I went around looking until I saw the outline of the building. And then I found the building, and we checked what highways were near it. And, and my cousin and I kind of drove by. And we figured we'd like drive by the service road and you know, just kind of check things out. But when you, when you take the exit, there's no service road. You take the exit, and you're, you're there. You've got this huge tall gate. You've got barbed wire along the top. And you've got this guard shack with really big guys with guns come all pouring out of the guard shack, asking a very reasonable question. Who are you, and why are you here? And I was like, oh, I, I, I'm here to see cryptos. And they're like, oh, sorry, you can't get in. It's for official business only. And I'm like, OK, I've come this far. And we tried every social engineering trick I had in the book. Can I, can I get an invitation? No. Yeah, official business only. Is there a public tour day? No, official business only. Can I get an invitation from my congressman? No, official business only. So I'm trying all these things. And again, these are big guys with guns. And so got turned away. And I'm like, damn, official business only. Well, I kept thinking about that for a while. Now, something else I was doing at the same time after September 11, because I had all of this code experience, is I was wondering if I could use my code experience to help out with the war on terrorism. So I had called up the local FBI in St. Louis. And I live in St. Louis. And I said, hi, I have all this code experience. Can I help? And they said, no. So, <laughs> so I called them back the next week. And can I help? No. And I, I was persistent. I kept calling back, kept calling back. And finally, I got an agent who said, OK, well, what is it that you know about? What kinds of code systems do you know about? And I listed out you know, PGP and UU encoding and steganography. And so, oh, steganography. You know, we, we've been hearing these rumors that Al-Qaeda might be using steganography as a way of sending hidden messages. But we don't really know that much about steganography. I know there's big brains in DC that know this stuff, but we're a St. Louis field office. Could you maybe put together a talk about uh, steganography and I'm like sure I'd be happy to so I put to get they thought I was going to come in and speak for 10 minutes and I did this 70 slide PowerPoint presentation with with animations and everything and and the talk was really well received I gave it to the FBI and Secret Service post inspectors customs agents and um, as I was putting together this talk and I was thinking official business official business maybe I can use this talk as a way of getting into CIA so when I did the talk I put this slide into the talk which is of the crypto sculpture. And in fact, steganography, as most of you probably know, is a way of hiding messages inside of digital images. Well, it's, it's other things, but that's one of the things that it is. So I got this image off of the CIA website, and I hid messages inside this image as part of my talk. And then every time I'd give the talk, I'd say, boy, I'd really love to go to CIA you know, and, and give this talk at CIA, because I didn't know anyone at CIA. Well, two years ago, as I mentioned, I was an alternate speaker here at DEF CON 
speaking on steganography, and I gave the talk, and I showed the slide, and, and I think it was probably about a thousand people, and it was up in the big roof tent. And uh, at the end of the talk, people were coming up, they gave me business cards and everything. And one person came up, and they came up to the podium, and they, they leaned close, and they said, I work at Langley. <laughs> and they said, I think I can get you in. I'm like, cool, cool. I, I, I'll go, I'll speak. I don't want to be paid. I just want a couple hours to go look at the crypto sculpture. And uh, they wouldn't give me their full name. I got a first name and a phone number. And uh, I'm like, okay, is it really someone CIA? Or is it just someone who's saying that they're CIA? And on and on. So after the convention, we write back and forth. And I made sure that they wrote to me from an official a address. So we had back and forth communication. And they said, yeah, we, we really do want you to come out and speak. And I'm like, cool, I don't want to be paid. I just want two hours to look at the crypto sculpture. And they said, okay. And then we keep talking and keep talking. And they said, okay, we want you to come out and speak. How much do you want to be paid? And I'm like, I don't want to be paid. I just want two hours to look at the crypto sculpture. So we go back and forth about this. And they keep saying, we have to pay you. How much do you want to be paid? And I'm like, make me an offer. I'll say yes. I don't want to be paid. I just want two hours to look at the crypto sculpture. So we go back and forth, and, and I said, fine, reimburse my, my plane fare or hotel, you know, 500 bucks, really, but I'm not going to haggle. Anything you offer, I'm going to say yes. I want my time to look at the sculpture. So finally, they, came, they got back to me, and they said, okay, we want you to speak on this date, and you're going to get your two hours to look at cryptos, and we're going to pay you $2,500. I was like, yes, okay, fine. <laughs> So I, I, I got my official business invitation, and I was able to see the sculpture, and I got some rubbings. Now, after my visit, I took these uh, rubbings that I got of the sculpture, and I went and I posted them on, on the web. And then I started getting all this correspondence, because my website, anyone who would go to Google and type in cryptos, my website would come up. So more and more people were contacting me. And then other people had theories, and I got some crazy theories, too. I had people that wrote to me saying, I've solved cryptos. And I'm like, cool, what does it say? And they'd say, it's proof that space aliens control the government. I'm like, okay. <laughs> Can you, show, can you duplicate the method of how you got this message for me, please? And they'd send me things with like weird circles and spirals and things. And I, there was a lot of people that were very, very intrigued by this, by this system. So now Cryptos has four codes on it. Three of the codes have been solved. The fourth part, and this is the fourth part here, is one of the most famous unsolved codes in the world. It's 97 or 98 characters. The question mark there, there's debate about whether it's part of part three or part of part four. And um, so I'll, I'll take cryptos apart a little bit. There are four panels on it. Two of those panels are a visionary table. I'll go over what a visionary table is really briefly. A keyword builds a cipher alphabet. And the word cryptos is the first keyword on, on two, probably three of the sections. It was solved in 1998. The first three parts were solved by a man named David Stein, who, who works at the CIA. The CIA is very careful to say, it, to say he did it completely on his own time. Uh, since then, he's, he's gotten married. He has a new baby. And as anyone with uh, a baby knows, all your free time goes right out the window. So he hasn't really worked on the code since then. Uh, Jim Gologli, who's a California computer scientist, also solved the first three parts with a computer attack. And then after Jim Gologli got written up in the paper, then the NSA came up. And they said, oh, yeah, we've got three people that solved those sections, too. But we're not going to tell you who, and we're not going to tell you when, because that's NSA. The uh, artist, a man named Jim Sanborn, who's still alive, he uh, lives in Washington, D.C. He was born in 1945. Um, he's attended a, a few different schools. He studied at Oxford University. He's traveled through Asia. Um, and when I started researching him, I wanted to find out what other sculptures he'd done. And so I contacted his agent, his gallery, and I said, do you have a list of everything he's done? And they said, no, there's no such list. And I'm like, well, Somewhere there must be such a list. They say, no, there's no such list. It would be much too complicated to make such a list. No one can possibly have a list of everything Sanborn's done. So I said, OK, I'm going to make a list of everything Sanborn's done. <laughs> and I started writing to art galleries all around the world. And packages started coming in. I, I, I called my apartment Smithsonian West, uh, just catalogs from art galleries. And I started getting, uh, I got my way into government agencies where they uh, approved the budget for various art and sculpture programs, and I started collecting all this data about it. And I made some interesting discoveries, which I'll go into in a minute. Uh, this is a little bit about David Stein, the CIA guy. These slides are also all on your CD. They're also all on the web. So if I go, if I skip anything really fast, you can get it later. Uh, this is Jim Gologli, the California computer scientist that solved parts one through three. And I had, uh, this is a, 
If any of you are from Los Angeles, this is the Hamburger Hamlet in Brentwood. That was uh, me and uh, May in, talking to Jim. So while I was researching Sanborn's artwork, what I found is that after he made the CIA sculpture, he made another version called the Untitled Cryptos piece, which he sold to a private collector. And on the Untitled Cryptos piece, it has all the text of Cryptos on one side, and on the other side, it has a lot of encrypted Russian text. And I'm like, hmm, maybe this piece in some way is a clue, or maybe this piece needs to be solved to solve cryptos. We don't know. And you're going to hear me say, we don't know a lot, or I don't know, because we have an unsolved code, and we have speculation, but there's no certainty here. So I found out the current location of this, this uh, piece. It, was, it went through a few hands, a private collector here, a museum there. Currently, it's in the home of a of a millionaire in Los Angeles. And when I was in Los Angeles for E3 a couple months ago, I contacted this millionaire through his art gallery and I said, hi, I'm Ilanka, I study cryptos. Can I come in and take a look at the sculpture? And he said, sure. So I went in and he was getting ready for a cocktail party. There's servants running all over the place. And, and I, I saw some interesting things, uh, some differences there. Uh, here's some close-up images of, of the side. So on the one side, we have text here that, that's English. This is the text of the CIA's crypto sculpture. And on the other side, we have all this encrypted Russian text. And what I found is that this encrypted Russian text is also duplicated on another of Sanborn's sculptures. And that sculpture is called the Cyrillic Projector. Now, this is a sculpture that he used for some gallery shows in the early 1990s. And then he sold it to the University of North Carolina, which is where it's been for the last seven years or so. And the, the students at North Carolina have no idea what it meant. Well, before I came along, they had no idea what it meant. They, they would see it. They thought it was Greek. They thought it had something to do with the local fraternities or, or something like that. <laughs> I'm serious. They, they, they did. <laughs> yeah. um, okay. So differences that I saw. Here, this is a close-up of the Untitled Cryptos piece. And you can see, like with the diagonals, this is the visionary table. It's, it's a lot of diagonals of letters. And then it launches into the ciphertext here. And this E-N-D-Y-A-H-R, this is the start of part three of cryptos, not part one of cryptos, part three. There's also some interesting things about these, remember the, the Y-A-H-R section, and I'll, I'll talk about those later. So the way that the letters are arranged is different from on the CIA version, and the order is different. Again, it starts with part three, not with part one. We don't know why, but it's intriguing that you do it that way. And something else I noticed, and this is over on the English side, is there's a very clear difference. Now, little things like the question mark, this is the same. The CIA version has a question mark, and it has, it has a, a few different question marks, and those are in the same locations. But one thing the CIA, CIA version doesn't have is these two dots. These two dots exist only on the untitled Cryptos piece and its sister piece, which is Antipodes, which is a, a slightly larger version, which is at the Hirshhorn Museum in DC. These two dots do not exist on the CIA version. Why? We don't know. But it's intriguing. So getting back to cryptos. Um, the visionary table, I'll, I'll go over how this is put together here. Notice also we have these reference alphabets. So we have A through Z along the top, A through Z running down the side here, and these two spaces at top and bottom. And those two spaces may be important with one of the theories, so I'll, I'll go into those in a moment. So first we talk about how to make a cipher alphabet. Using the keyword of cryptos, you have 26 letters here, and I actually have a little a animation of how to make a, uh, a cipher alphabet. This is like the first flash animation I ever did. Okay. So what you do is you take the alphabet, and then you take your keyword, and you take the letters of that keyword out of the alphabet. In this case, we're spelling the word cryptos. And then you pile up all the rest of the letters after it. So you still have 26 letters, but you can use any keyword you want, and it kind of changes things. How's that for an animation, by the way? Okay. <laughs> So once you've got the cipher alphabet here, and then on cryptos it just makes a grid. So every one of these is shifted by one. Now, an interesting property of it when you do it this way is you see we can read the word cryptos here, and you can also read the word cryptos going vertically here. Now this is what happens when you use a single keyword. You can also use a double keyword system. So we would have the word cryptos here, and then you might spell out a different word here. So you might have the second keyword of the word apple. So you would take this A and move it over to the margin, and you would take that P and move it to the margin and leave that one alone. And that would be a different way of creating a grid. And that's exactly what was used for the first part of Cryptos. So here's the first part, which is the top two lines on the sculpture here, EMUFP there. And I, I won't go into this in detail, but basically we have the keyword Cryptos here, and we have a different word here, which is palimpsest, 
which means a, a scroll that it ha has had a message scraped off of it and then another message written on it. So you might be seeing bits of the old message showing through. And you take each word of the ciphertext and you put it on a different line and then you trace up. So the E translates to a B, the M translates to an E, the U translates to a T and so forth. So E M U F P H Z comes out to B E T W E E N or between. So if you did that to the entire message, there you, we have the two lines of ciphertext with the keywords cryptos and palimpsest. And it comes out to say between subtle shading and the absence of light lies the nuance of occlusion. So there's a typo. It should say illusion, but it says occlusion. Now this, this typo is hard coded right into the sculpture. And I've talked to the artist about it. I said, was this just a mis mistake? He says, no, it's deliberate. But he says it's not what it is that's so important as where it is, its orientation or its positioning. What does that mean? We don't know, but it's something that the artist said. <laughs> right. Now part two starts with line three here, the VFP, and goes all the way down to the bottom of this panel here. So all of this is part two. This is the cipher text for part two. And in this case, we have, it's the same system, but with different keywords. Instead of cryptos and palimpsest, it's cryptos and abscissa. And it says, it was totally invisible. How's that possible? They used the Earth's magnetic field. The information was gathered and transmitted underground, another typo there, to an unknown location. Does Langley know about this? They should. It's buried out there somewhere. Who knows the exact location? Only WW. This was his last message. 38 degrees, 57 minutes, 6.5 seconds north. 77 degrees, 8 minutes, 44 seconds west. ID by rows. Or maybe ID by row S. We didn't have punctuation, so we're guessing at punctuation here. Now anyone here who's done geocaching knows that this thing about 6.5 seconds north, a tenth of a second of latitude is a very, very specific location, about 10 feet across. So, of course, pulled up the maps, looked at that, and it points to the general location of CIA headquarters. But where in CIA headquarters? Well, it points to the courtyard where Kryptos is. Does it point to Kryptos? No. It points to an area about 150 feet southeast of Kryptos. Now, I've, I didn't know this exactly when I was there, but I've talked to people who work at the agency, and they've gone and looked at that spot, and they say they don't really see anything unusual. It's, it's a normal courtyard. There's trash cans. There's manhole covers, which might or might not mean something, um, but, but nothing that looks specifically code-related. So it's one of the very intriguing mysteries. All right, part three is this bottom panel. It starts here and goes down to about the fourth row from the bottom. Also, if you can see it on the slide, the, this is uh, the first part on the untitled crypto space. We had E-N-D-Y-A-H-R. And you can see that some of the letters are slightly out of alignment. And again, the artist, Sanborn, I showed him some of these slides. And he pointed at those and said, those are important. <laughs> okay. All right. So this is part three of the ciphertext. Now, someone who's experienced with cryptography, when they look at the ciphertext, something's going to jump out at them. They're going to notice something different. And what it is is that the... The, the consistency of the letters is different from the other two sections. Here you're going to see a lot of E's, a lot of T's, a lot of A's, a lot of O's, which is the English frequency table, the most common letter, commonly used letter being E, T, A, O, I, N. And so what this is, it's not with a visionary system. This is a transposition cipher. All of the letters of the plain text message are here. They're just reorganized. So there's a few different ways to pull this out. One method that I came up with was to take all the letters and to put them into these nice regular rows. And at the far right here, in the smack in the middle, we have an S. Now remember the first section, that ID by rows or ID by row S, which may or may not have something to do with this. This is just speculation. If you take that S and then you count down four, one, two, three, wrap around four, and you get an L, come down four, one, two, three, four. You get an O, one, two, three, four, W, one, two, three, four, L, one, two, three, four, Y, S, L, O, W, L, Y, slowly. So we have a word. And if you keep doing that, you can zip out an entire message with that exact method. And we have, so it starts a slowly, desperately. And the plain text here is slowly, desperately, slowly. The remains of passage debris that encumbered the lower part of the doorway was removed. With trembling hands, I made a tiny breach in the upper left-hand corner. And then, widening the hole a little, I inserted the candle and peered in. The hot air escaping from the chamber caused the flame to flicker. But presently, details of the room within emerged from the mist. Can you see anything, Q? Who recognizes that quote? Howard Carter. Very good. This is a, a paraphrased extract from the diary of Howard Carter on the day that he discovered King Tut's tomb. It's from November 26, 1922. Desperately is misspelled as well. Now, I think, I'm not sure that this one 
was part of the puzzle. I think that this one may have been a genuine screw up. But I don't know for sure, because when, when I asked Sanborn about the other two typos, he said that those were deliberate. When I asked him about this one, he kind of gave me a kind of smirk and said, it's possible, anything's possible. Um. <laughs> the extraneous X's are very intriguing as well. Sometimes they're used as sentence separators and sometimes not. Um, it could mean, it, it could have something to do with different speakers. It could be, again, the X's could be some part of a, a positioning thing. We've tried circling the location on the sculpture where the X's exist to see if, if we saw some pattern and sometimes you like almost see a regular parallelogram or I, I studied astronomy so I'm like it sort of looks like Orion and I, we haven't found anything definite but th they're definitely intriguing that they're in some of the locations but not all. X's and Q's are commonly used as filler uh, by cryptographers when they're writing a message if they need to have something that comes out to an even number of letters and you don't have the correct number of letters in the message they'll add in X's and Q's. Uh, the, can you see anything Q? The Q might mean a question mark. And that's why we have this thing about the question mark at the beginning of part four. Is it part of part three, since part three ends in a question, or is it part of part four? We don't know. Right. The, the only punctuation on the CIA crypto sculpture is question marks. Uh, I don't, I, around that time, I couldn't tell you the exact, does anyone know the dates that Woodrow Wilson was president? World War I. Okay, so a little bit earlier. Um, WW might mean Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson's birthplace is actually near Washington, D.C. I went driving by there and took pictures of the home to see if maybe it had something to do with WW. Our leading theory on who WW is is that it means William Webster who was the director of the CIA at the time that the crypto sculpture was installed. And according to Sanborn, was the, the leading force in getting more artwork for the agency. According to Sanborn, there was actually quite a feud among the CIA leadership that Webster wanted to give the CIA a kind of a softer image and that there were other high ups in the CIA that didn't want the CIA to have a softer image. And Sanborn thought that he was kind of getting caught in the middle of this battle. For example, he talked about how he had an entire truck full of stone for some work he was doing at CIA that just disappeared one day. And Sanborn was convinced that it was a, a message from some of the people at CIA that they didn't want him there. Others said it was just a screw up. Sometimes th things disappear. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Right. Was there a question here? OK. Um, now, it's also possible that the can you see anything is a crib for the next section, because what Howard Carter said after that was either yes, wonderful things, or yes, it is wonderful, which if the word yes is part of part four, that might help us towards solving part four. Again, we don't know. This is just all speculation. We're doing it on time. Okay. So again, we come back to part four. Good. And now, okay, so now we have... A, actually going back to the untitled Kryptos piece. So we have the text of Kryptos was also on the smaller version, and we had this encrypted Russian text on the other side. So I'm like, well, maybe we need to solve this encrypted Russian text, and it might give us a clue towards solving Kryptos. So I, I told you all this. We started looking at it early last year, um, and solving it came out to be a three-step process, transcribing it, decrypting it, and then translating it. And each one of them was difficult in its own way. So it started when a man named Randall Bullock, who's come to DEF CON on occasion, and uh, also comes to some of the other conventions like Freaknik and Atlanticon on the East Coast that I go to. And he was driving through North Carolina, and he stopped off, and he saw the sculpture. And he took a whole bunch of pictures and put them up on the web. And I showed them to my cryptography group. We've got about, at that point, we had about 50 people in the group. Now we have over 200 people in the group around the world that are all working really hard on cracking cryptos. And he said, Let, let's get this thing solved. Um, so. I presented to the group and we said, okay, we need to transcribe it, we need to crack this code. And like two weeks went by, I didn't really hear anything from anybody, so I'm like, okay, I'll start transcribing it. So I sat and I spent weeks working from photos, transcribing each character from the way the light was shining and looking at reversed images of, of the sculpture and came up with this transcript of the text that was on the sculpture. And then I presented this transcript to the group, and I said, okay, here's a transcript of the projector. At which point, two other people from the group came up and said, oh, yeah, we have transcripts too. I'm like, thanks for telling me. <laughs> <laughs> but it was also good, because at that point, we had three entirely independent transcripts, which we could compare to make sure that we had one really hyper-accurate hyper transcript. So we compared them all, and we had about a dozen errors here and there. And then I, we uh, messed with it, and 
didn't really find anything cryptographically, and we posted it on the web. And because uh, I, I wanted to release it to the world and see if maybe some other bright person out there might use our transcript and figure something out. Well, maybe somebody did, maybe somebody didn't. In July, I got a message from my customer service department at my game company, and they said, we got this really weird letter through our anonymous feedback form. We, we have a form where customers can send us messages. We won't know who the customers are. And the message said, forward this to Ilanka. And so they forwarded it to me. They had no idea what it was about. And in the message, it said, I have managed to solve the cryptographic portion of the cipher. It is, as advertised, not terribly difficult. P.S. I am doing this anonymously because I have a sense of humor. <laughs> I, I mean, they did say it was at, about the Cyrillic projector. Uh, there was no name on it, and our anonymous feedback form is really an, anon an anonymous feedback form, so there was no way to, to trace it back. So I was like, okay, so does this mean someone solved it and we need to do a press release and say it's done, or, or what's the protocol here? So I went to Jim Gologley, who used to be the head of the American Cryptogram Association, and I said, what, what's, what's the system here? If someone says they've solved it but hasn't announced an answer, do they get credit? And he said, no. Uh, this has been talked over extensively. And just like in science, doing something is not what gives you the credit for it. It's doing it and publishing what you've done, allowing others to verify and duplicate your work. If it can't be duplicated, then it, it's probably not real. And he says that this is one of the foundations of science, that it has to be something that other people can duplicate in an independent laboratory. So I took this email and I filed it away. Again, I didn't know for sure if the guy had solved the code because he didn't really give me any of the plain text, and went on with my business and, and we did some other crypto things. And then um, in September, I was reading my web logs, which I do on a daily basis because I'm nosy, and I saw that there was an interesting page linking to me that I'd never seen before. And the page had this URL. It was an earthlink net with the URL of cpsolution.htm. I'm like, hmm, that's a really interesting URL. So I went and I looked at it. And what it was was a, a Russian visionaire table. Uh, how, how intriguing. And I sent this along to the group and I said, I, again, I didn't know if this was one of the crazies or if this was something real, and I was at work, so I couldn't really look at it at the time. And then after work, this was on a Friday evening, I, pl I played with it a little bit, and I found I started getting some recognizable Russian text coming out of it. I'm like, hmm, this, this may really be it. So I stayed up until about 3 o'clock in the morning, and it, it's not just a visionary table. There's some other twists in it, but it, about around 3 o'clock in the morning, and I came up with something that was like this massive text that had a few Russian words in it, but I couldn't really read it. And I was really sleepy, and I went to sleep, and I, I was trying to find people I knew in IRC who could read Russian, and I, I couldn't find anybody who really wanted to help, and it, it was frustrating. And then the next morning, I, um, I got up, and I actually had this problem where I wanted to work on the code, but I had real life intruding. I had some friends who had promised that I would help them move, so they had boxes that needed to be carried. So I'm like, okay, I'm on the verge of cracking this huge international code, but I also promised them I'd help them move. So, <laughs> so I did my best to do both. So I'd carrying boxes, and I had my cell phone. I'm calling the cell phone. I'm carrying more boxes and going out in the front yard to try and get a good cell phone signal. And I finally found someone who could uh, read Russian. And in between carrying boxes and working the cell phone, we, we started getting bits and pieces out of it. So th this was the text that I got after putting it through the Vision Air table. Um, does anyone here read Russian? Yeah, there okay. there. Yes, there are typos here, so that made it complicated as well. So you can verify a couple of the future slides that are coming up here. So this is a, an English example of the problem. And I, I, I won't make you suffer with this, and we're also short on time. So what this says is, this sentence might be easily understandable to a native English speaker, but someone not familiar with English would have a great deal of trouble reading or translating it. Plus the fact that there isn't any punctuation isn't any help either. And, and so this is what I was dealing with, the Russian. I, I wasn't a native Russian speaker. I, I can pick out a few words. I have Slavic family. I used to be fluent in Serbo-Croatian a long, long time ago, but I, I definitely couldn't read it. So I, but I found a native speaker, a friend of a friend of my father, and working back and forth with the boxes and the cell phone, by Saturday afternoon, September 20th, we had translated the whole thing. 
And also at the same time, I had members of the cryptography group that were using that URL and were tracing back the URL to find out who, who had that solution page. And it was a man named Frank Kaur, who lives in North Carolina. And he had been the one that had sent me that anonymous message back in July. However, he said that he'd gotten as far as the mass of text and had never been able to get further than that. He'd try playing with, with uh, Russian dictionaries and himself not being a native Russian speaker, he couldn't really get any further. Also, another member of my cryptography group came up and he said that around September 18th, he too had come up to the point of that mass of Russian text but hadn't wanted to say anything because he couldn't tell what it said. So September 20th was really the first time that we knew what the message said. And I presented this information to the group and it was, it was verified and duplicated and so we went out and, and did a press release. I won't read the whole thing to you but it basically came out to be two different texts. And they, they use slightly different vision error systems as well, which really screwed up frequency analysis counts. The first part was instructions to uh, secret service agents, we assume, on how to develop a source and how you want to psychologically control the source and weave a psychological net around them, which you pull tight at the appropriate time. So uh, if you can control a source, then you can trust the information you get from that source. And the second part was uh, an extract from what looked like some sort of a memo about Sakharov, who was a Soviet dissident, and concerns that statements that Sakharov was making were going to be used by the Americans for an anti-Soviet agenda. So I, I'm saying that this came from classified KGB correspondence. How do we know it's classified KGB correspondence? Well, we found the source document for one of these parts. And uh, this, is, um, this was smuggled out of Russia uh, around the late 1980s, which is right around the time that Kryptos was, was being made. And what I'll do is I'll expand this part here. And that's the subject line. And can you, the guy who speaks Russian, can you verify that this is close to what, that, what the second part was saying about it? it says Sakharov in there? And yep, yeah, he's, he's nodding. So. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Um, and the reason that we know it was classified is because over here it says secret. No, secret. Yeah. Now, um, after we did the press release and it went up on Slashdot, and so my normal web counter, web hits, I might get like three hits an hour, five hits an hour. So I, I was like reading my web blog the, the next day and seeing the tracks by hour, you know, three, five, eight, nine thousand and thirty-seven. <laughs> <laughs> And over the course of two days, I probably got about 50,000 visitors from Slashdot. My web server ran great. I'm very proud of that. And I really enjoyed reading the chatter that was going on Slashdot. And as most of you know, it's very high-spirited, very irreverent. And I really enjoyed a couple of the joke solutions that were posted. Um, and, and they said, what the Cyrillic projector really says is, send more vodka. <laughs> That was one. And the other one, and, and this is, I think, my favorite of the alternate suggestions, that what the Cyrillic projector really says is, keep information away from this and score. <laughs> okay. So, um, so we went back, and, and because there were typos in the Russian text, and we went back and we looked at the projector, and we circled where the typos were. We wanted to make sure that our transcript was correct. The typos hadn't come from us. But no, the, the errors were in the sculpture. We don't know if the, the errors were, again, hard-coded in by the artist, or if they were just a screw-up by some assistant who wasn't familiar with Russian. It, some days I think one, some days the other. Uh, today I'm thinking it was more, more likely to be just a screw-up. But we don't know. Okay, going back to cryptos. Um, okay, now I'm going to be going into some really kind of blue sky stuff and, and I, I'm just sharing speculation with you. Now this is an, an overhead view of CIA headquarters. On the right over here is, this is the old headquarters building. This is actually the picture that I used to find the building in the first place. I got this off of MapQuest. And over here on the right, this is the old headquarters building. And then in the mid-1980s, they ne decided that they needed more room, so they commissioned the new headquarters building over here. And along with commissioning the new headquarters building, they also commissioned some art to be placed around the complex. This white building here in the middle with the funny-shaped roof is the cafeteria. So there's a, a, a wall of windows here so that the uh, employees at the agency while they're eating can look out over the courtyard and in this courtyard is where the crypto sculpture exists and I'm going to have a close-up at a different time of year so again we have the the white shape the the funny shape roof this is the cafeteria wall of windows here looking out of the courtyard this little squiggle right here this is the crypto sculpture 
Now, Sam Warren, when he uh, came in and did this, he did not do just the crypto sculpture. He actually did several pieces. He did the crypto sculpture here. He also did this entire green semicircular area. There's a duck pond here. Uh, he's done quite a bit of landscaping here. And he also did several pieces out here by the front entranceway. And uh, I'll have close-ups on another slide. But there's several large slabs here with sheets of copper with Morse code messages. And here's some pictures of those. So they kind of stick out of the ground. Here's a, a walkway going by with Morse code messages. And these things say like SOS, lucid memory, T is your position. Uh, there's also a compass engraved on one of these slabs where the N on the compass does not point true north. The needle on the compass does not point true north. It is pointing towards another stone over there, which is, a, we believe, a magnetic stone, a lodestone. Sanborn has done other pieces that have lodestones. As a matter of fact, this compass, Sanborn has done two other pieces around the D.C. area that have compasses like this. I think that one in Maryland, one in Virginia, and, and this piece here. And uh, we've tried triangulating them, seeing if they're pointing at an intersecting point. Uh, we don't know. So, but uh, it's, it's interesting. Um, and I won't go into all these in detail because, again, we're running low on time. There are some other methods that have been proposed about coming up with the, the plain text out of Part 3. Uh, someone's pointed out that cryptos is a key word for Part 3. If you, if you use the number 1473625, like the S-L-O-W-L-Y, off of line 1, line 4, line 7, line 3. Now, how does cryptos equal this word? Well, if you take the letters in cryptos and you alphabetize them and then you number them one through seven and then you spell it again correctly and move the numbers around you get the number one four seven three six two five which is exactly the key that could come up with part three now uh, there's mathematical formulas um a gary warzen who's the other co-creator of the cryptos discussion group came up with a, a system uh, where instead of diagonals you actually get nice verticals that, that come out with this message um again we have the letters that are out of alignment and here's some close-ups of those. The Sanborn did say those were important. Someone pointed out that on the tableau side, at the end of the lines, which should be the same as the cipher alphabet, it should go E, F, G, H, I, J, L, no, H, I, L, L. There's two lines that end with the letter L. This line should end with the J, but it doesn't. It ends with the L. Is this important? It might be. It might be a clue. We don't know. Um, one interesting one way to look at it is that before we knew about the L, and we counted all the characters on the sculpture, on the tableau side, there were 864 characters. And on the ciphertext side, there were 867. So we're like, okay, 867, 860, that's nice. And then, okay, but we missed a letter, so we have the L. So now we have, okay, 865 on one side and 867 on the other. Okay, that's nice. But remember I was talking about those reference spaces that were at the, the beginning of the alphabet on one side? that we're taking about the same amount of space as the letter. So if we include those two reference spaces, now it's 867 and 867. And all of a sudden, these numbers get much more interesting, that there's exactly the same number of characters on either side of the sculpture. Uh, spelling errors I told you about. Um, Cyrillic projector, this was something that was just noticed, I think, within the last week or so. Uh, I'll show you a picture of the projector in daylight. And these plates are bolted together with uh, bolts that are very regularly spaced, about four inches apart. And someone noticed that there was an extra bolt on one line. And you can't really see it on this side, but if, if we look from the other side, so we're looking towards the inside of it, and there's a bolt sticking out on the inside. And this bolt is at exactly the same line as the keyword of Medusa, which is one of the keywords that was used for solving the projector. So maybe this was some sort of an artistic thing to draw a viewer's eye to the line where the key word was. Maybe it's used for structural integrity. Maybe it's a screw up. We don't know. But it's interesting. Here, here are those reference spaces again. Um, also, if anyone is familiar with, with Visionaire systems, this Visionaire was a, devised by a French uh, mathematician a few hundred years ago. It used to be considered the most uncrackable code in the world. Um, and now we can crack it pretty easily with computers as long as we have enough ciphertext to work from. The reference alphabet here, A through Z, is one method of doing a visionaire table. But the crypto sculpture, the, three, the two parts that use visionaire, did not use this method of visionaire. They used a different method of visionaire. And, uh, but this method of visionaire is the method that was used on the Cyrillic projector. Uh, so again, a, a very perplexing thing. Um, this is another old cipher system by Thomas Jefferson. He, he, he encrypted messages this way, where he had a series of, of wheels and then you would turn them, and you could reorder the wheels by different numbers. 
And perhaps the reason that cryptos is designed like this wavy thing is that it's a cylinder that's taken apart. So maybe it needs to be put together like a cylinder and then reorganize the rings. This is just a speculation. Uh, part four, also we notice that the letters here, we have KR, there's a YP here, and here we have a TOS. So we have all the letters of cryptos that are all kind of close to each other. Uh, if we line them all up in seven letter rows, we get several doubled letters that are directly under each other. That's an intriguing aspect of it. And cryptos has seven letters. And again, if we, so we have the seven letter rows is interesting. Um, this is Ed Scheidt. This is the man who came up with the code systems for cryptos. He said that he thought the last part would probably take 10 years before it was cracked. Um, and this is something else that happened last December that is, is worth talking about. And, and I know I'm, I'm only down to a few more minutes. I, uh, I had a contact at CIA who, who knew what the answer to Cryptos was because the, the artist knows it, that it was given an envelope to the director. And, and this contact was very intrigued to see me visit CIA again. And he said, you need to get back on campus. And, and I was like, well, I, I need official business. And, and he said, well, try what you can. And if you can't get in, let me know. So I tried all my contacts, couldn't get back in. So I wrote back to this individual and I said, I cannot get back onto CIA. You said you, maybe you'd pull some strings. About three hours later, I get this IM. I get an IM from the screen named Molly H. And the IM is one word, one line, and it said, the key to cryptos is comitet. And uh, comitet, I don't know how many people here recognize the word, comitet is the K in, K in KGB. Now I sent a message back to this individual. They said that there was no reply. I sent another message back. They were gone. I reach out through my security contacts. I find out this is, this is a screen name that was hacked and was deleted shortly after this message was sent to me. <laughs> okay. So maybe it's a hint. Maybe it's a hoax. I don't know. Uh, KGB. All right. Uh, Molly Hale also, this may be a coincidence, the head of the CIA's public affairs department is Molly Hale. Anyone who's written to CIA saying, I want in, and gets back a letter saying no, the letter's probably been signed by Molly Hale. Right. Um, also, it was interesting that whoever said it used the word key and not keyword. That's a very crypto thing to be saying. And Comitet does have seven letters, which matches with Cryptos and some of the other things. Uh, th here's that source document, and I'll just point out Comitet right there. So was this a hint or a hoax? We don't know. Um, whoever did send it, we know this about them. They knew I was working on Cryptos. Not hard. Go to Google, type in Cryptos. My name comes up. They maybe knew some CIA structure. Maybe they knew some crypto terminology. Maybe they knew some Cold War history. Comitet is not a word that's commonly known. And they did send a seven-letter key. And no matter what else we know about them, we do know that they know how to cover their tracks. So, Sam Bourne does have other sculptures around the world in many different languages. He does tend to reuse things. Three of his sculptures use quotes from Adam Smith. Three have compasses. One of those compass ones, by the way, is next to a sculpture called Hidden Under the Three Events. And uh, he also designed a restaurant in Washington, D.C. called the Zola Spy Restaurant. And one entire wall of this restaurant is covered with classified documents from Sanborn's private collection. One of these documents, and these documents are in English, Russian, and French, one of these documents is a source document for the Cyrillic projector. We have not been able to closely examine all these documents. Some of them are like way up towards the ceiling. But if he used what a Cyrillic projector document, it's possible there might be a source document for Kryptos in there as well. He does have other references to Kryptos around the restaurant. So, yes? How do you get a personal collection of classified documents? <laughs> <laughs> um, Sanborn's father worked as a, I don't know what's going on here. Yeah. yeah. Sanborn's father worked uh, for the Library of Congress for 30 years. So he was uh, one of the head archivists. Uh, some real quick things about cryptos and pop culture. Uh, I don't know how many people here have read the Da Vinci Code, but in the artwork of the book jacket, there are five puzzles hidden within the artwork of the book jacket. Two of those puzzles refer to cryptos. I'll go through these. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, on the back side on here, it says only WW knows. And on another part, we have in very faint light red on dark red, and these are the latitude and longitude coordinates. I don't believe that Dan Brown had anything to do with the creation of cryptos. He was just fascinated by it. So I get about 500 visitors a day from people that have read Da Vinci Code and are now interested in cryptos. This was one of the members of my crypto group. He, he made a 3D model of the crypto sculpture and imported it in, into a half-life engine just so he could take a crowbar to it and shatter it into a thousand pieces. <laughs> Uh, 
Um, and I, I don't have time for the NPR thing, so I'll skip that. Um, so summary, Cryptos has four sections of code, three of the four have been solved. Uh, he also has this untitled Cryptos piece with two sides, the CIO side and the KGB side. The KGB side was what we solved last year when we cracked the Cyrillic projector. Both sides have spelling errors. We don't know how many are accidental and how many are deliberate. Both Jim Sanborn and Ed Scheidt have said that it was designed to be solved. I asked, uh, I asked Sanborn flat out, is part four solvable? He said, yes, it ain't easy, but it's solvable. Uh, anyone who wants to help, um, I would love help translating some of Sanborn's other sculptures. He's got them written in the Iroquois, Algonquin, Abyssinian. So anyone that has access to anyone who can read those bizarre languages, I would really help. Uh, 3D modelers, uh, this is probably the most detailed 3D model we have so far of crypto. So we want to make a full walk around so we can see the way the sunlight goes through it. And uh, anyone who's got 3D skills, let me know. And to get more information, just go to Google and type in Cryptos. That's, that's the easiest way to go. Also, if you're on AIM, my screen name is Ilanka. And I think I've got maybe two minutes for questions, and then I'll be, nope, no time for questions. So anyone who has questions, I'm going to be going out into the lobby, and uh, you can ask me questions there. Thank you all very much for coming. <laughs>